Hello, my name is Annette Harris and I'm a clinical social worker with Montgomery County Public Schools. And today I'll be presenting on the symptoms of a major depressive disorder or single episode. And the focus is on a major depressive single episode because people can experience more than one episode and they can even experience a different type of episode such as manic or mixed episode, uh, just as two examples. So what I hope you'll get out of today's presentation is to better understand the signs and symptoms of a major depressive episode, to better understand when professional intervention may be necessary, to better understand the role of equity in mental health, as well as the role of stigma in mental health, and then to finally learn about available resources. So for a diagnosis of major depressive um, episode, at least five of the following nine symptoms have been present for two weeks and reflect a change from uh, the previous level of functioning. So one of the symptoms must be depressed mood or loss of interest in pleasurable activities. All right, symptoms must be present almost daily for most of the day. Symptoms must cause clinically significant distress or impairment in work, school, social situations, or other important areas of functioning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, for those with a less severe episode, the impact on functioning may not be noticeable, but the functioning requires significantly increased activity. So for example, these people may struggle with getting out of bed or struggling to focus at school or work. It's just not going to be noticeable to you, but it takes an inordinate amount of effort for them to push through. Okay, so for a diagnosis of major depressive um, episode, the symptoms cannot be the result of substance um, or a medical condition, because there are substances and medical conditions that can cause similar symptoms. Um, but once these issues are addressed, then the symptoms usually abate. And additionally, a diagnosis of MDE may be ruled out if symptoms are, um, are better explained by another episode um, or another disorder, I'm sorry. So for example, a schizoaffective disorder or a schizophrenia. All right, so let's begin to take a look at the nine possible symptoms. So uh, symptom one, depressed mood, which is described as feelings of sadness, hope, hopelessness, feeling down in the dumps. Um, and it's important to note that in children and adolescents, these can present as irritability as opposed to depressed mood. And that's an important distinction because we don't want to miss a diagnosis of MDE in children because we're looking for their symptoms to align with those of an adult. Um, additionally, some people may experience increased somatic complaints. So for example, headaches, body aches, upset stomach. And symptom one must be present, must be present for a diagnosis of a major depressive episode. So now looking at symptoms two and three. Um, two, extremely reduced interest or pleasure in all activities. So for example, socializing with friends is no longer enjoyable or a complete loss in traveling. Uh, number three, significant unintentional weight gain or loss. But again, in children, this can look differently. In children, it could just be that they're not making their expected weight gains. All right, symptom four, insomnia, which is an inability to sleep, or hypersomnia, which is excessive daytime sleeping or prolonged nighttime sleep. So number five, psychomotor agitation or retardation almost daily. Um, unable to sit still, pacing, tugging at one's clothes, slowed speech, slowed cognition, slowed body movements are examples of psychomotor agitation or retardation. All right, symptom six is a loss of energy or fatigue. 
um, almost daily, which makes small tasks that require great effort. So for example, showering or going for a walk or trying to get laundry done. Number seven, feeling worthless or excessive misplaced guilt almost daily and preoccupations with insignificant failings. So for example, you might mispronounce a, a word during a speech, like I'm kind of doing now, <laughs> or you didn't wish your boss a happy birthday. So these small infractions that you simply can't let go of. And finally, the last two symptoms, eight and nine. So number eight is poor concentration, indecisiveness almost daily. Um, and in children, perhaps it's a drop in grades. And with elderly, it can present as symptoms of early dementia. Number nine, recurrent, recurrent thoughts of death, suicidal ideation, suicide, suicidal attempt, uh, or specific plan. Frequently and, and I'm sorry, frequency and intensity can vary. So going back to elderly people, um, an inability to concentrate, they, it can mimic the symptoms of early dementia. So it's of the utmost importance to get the correct diagnosis. And suicidal ideation um, or thoughts of wanting to die and they can be present with or without a plan. So without a plan is just a general thought. For example, I don't wanna be here anymore or life would be easier if I weren't around. Whereas with an actual plan, things are planned out as to how one would go about committing suicide. So it's important to remember though that only five of these nine symptoms need to be present for a diagnosis of um, MDE. So again, the topic of equity and stigma, they've taken a more prominent seat at the table as of late. So let's look at its connection to MDE. So people of color are often identified as different and different oftentimes means less than. So their symptoms aren't taken as seriously. And stigma is related to poor patient outcomes, both physically and from a mental health perspective, such as missed appointments or poor medication management. And so clearly, if you're not seeing your healthcare provider regularly or aren't being compliant with your medications, then naturally you're going to have worse outcomes than someone who is being compliant. Okay, intersectional stigma. So that's people of color intersecting with another factor such as being female or being elderly. And that's just two examples. Um, that intersectionality is associated with amplified consequences. So perceived stigma is strongly associated with increased chances of depression. And then conversely, stigma reduction in healthcare environments can improve physical and mental health outcomes for people of color. So how can caregivers combat stigma and, and, and inequity? Um, educate yourself on race-based discrimination so you can recognize and address it as necessary. Um, this won't always be easy, but it's necessary if we're going to move the needle forward. Be willing to have courageous conversations with your mental health care provider. Be aware of your own perceptions and their impact on your mental health, because we all view life through our respective personal lenses. And so you have to ask yourself, how are my perceptions impacting my mental health and then adjust accordingly. And then of course, keep all of your medical appointments and be compliant with your medications. So if you're interested in additional resources, you can contact the Montgomery County Crisis Center, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, Department of Health and Human Services, the Pro Bono Counseling Project, Every Mind, 
You can also contact the behavioral health department of your private health care uh, provider. You can also contact your medical health care provider to review signs and symptoms that you notice. Um, also, feel free to reach out to your child's teacher to help determine if symptoms that you notice at home are also present in the school setting, and if so, to what degree are they impacting school functioning. And finally, if such concerns are present at school, you can also reach out to the school counselor and school psychologist um, regarding your concerns, and they would be a good resource for families um, of children who are experiencing mental health issues.